This week on KSL Plus. I think part of the issue is you don't really know. You've probably noticed it online or on store shelves. Some people are buying a lot. They're demanding a lot of stuff. You may have felt it Just at the checkout. A huge 6.2% jump in consumer prices nationally and a 7% jump in Utah. We haven't seen this kind of inflation. We haven't seen 6.2%. Uh, in 30 years. It was 1990. It's a perfect economic storm. Shipping delays. I, I would recommend people go out, get your Christmas presents now. Product and labor shortages. Don't wait until the last week. And inflation. Because it might not be available and it'll probably be more expensive than it is today. I'm Matt Rascone and this is KSL Plus. And at the start of the holiday shopping season, we're talking about supply chain issues and all of the not so merry things that come with it. Researchers from Adobe Analytics tracked 18 different product categories in the month of October and got out of stock notifications over 2 billion times. That's worse than last year and much worse than two years ago. The supply chain does seem to be showing signs of improvement, but the last few months have shown just how fragile it can be. Little things here and there that just kind of add up to a few extra dollars. And it's not just hitting consumers, but schools too no matter how difficult it's become. We definitely need help. To find food. We're just not able to get our deliveries in. And workers. The workload hasn't changed and there's less people doing that. There's no getting around the need to prepare 44,000 meals a day for students at Granite School District. Kids are counting on breakfast and lunch in their classrooms and at their schools each and every day. On top of that, demand for free school lunches has only increased this year with kids back in school. So it's kind of like a perfect storm. The volume of meals have gone up, the labor shortages, the food supply chain shortages has just compounded the whole issue. So why exactly are we seeing so many snags on such a global level? What exactly is a supply chain? How does it work? And why does it seem to be broken right now? So I think most people think of it in terms of products and that either they can get a product at the store or they can't. I think supply chain professionals tend to think of it more as a series of processes or the whole system that's in place to produce things and distribute things to consumers. I sat down with Scott Webb. He's an associate professor of supply chain management at BYU. Here's our conversation. The other way I look at it that, that makes a lot of sense to me is it's actually the, the team of companies that work together to get stuff kind of from an idea all the way down to the store shelves. And uh, a good example is the iPhone. Um, it has something like 140 different suppliers. So there are 140 different people in about 30 different countries that supply the parts for the iPhone. And the supply chain is bringing all those parts together, manufactured in the factory, and then they fly iPhone, iPhones when they're finished, they fly them to the United States from Boxconn in China. So supply chain is kind of that whole series of processes to get the iPhone from all the pieces, parts to finished product and in, in front of the consumer. So when we look at just off the coast of California, all these ship containers that are sitting there, we see these big semis carrying these containers that have nowhere to go, you know, in different neighborhoods and things and dropping them off in random places. Uh, what are we actually looking at? That's actually kind of the tail end of the supply chain. So it's, it's almost complete at that point. Um, and the main reason is the vast majority, we're, we're more of a consumer nation than a producer nation. So we, we consume a lot more than we produce. So at the port of Long Beach, they're mostly finished goods coming in. So they've, they're products that have been made usually in China and um, you know, they brought them by ship to the United States. And normally that's a really fairly reliable process. You know, you, you, in the past I've always told students say hey, it takes about 20, 20 plus days, just a little over 20 to get from the port in Shanghai to the port in Long Beach. And, and now it's their ships have been there for six months. Wow. How would you describe the, the disconnect? Yeah, actually it's a super complex problem. The 
as countries and as teams of companies, we build a super reliable process that has worked for years and years and years. And it's robust enough that if we have a spike in demand, you know, usually there, it, there's a little spike and then things kind of come back to normal. We had spikes in demand for things that were a little weird, you know, that we'd never really had demand for before. Um, and at the same time, we had the people in the factories and the people at the ports were being told they couldn't come to work because of the virus. So COVID affected both the demand for products. And, and I mean, a simple product that everyone knows about is toilet paper. You know, when COVID kicked off, everyone started hoarding toilet paper. The demand for residential toilet paper, the small rolls, went sky high and the demand for commercial toilet paper just plummeted because no one was at work. But the factories didn't have the capabilities to switch between. So we kind of, you know, we ran out of the residential toilet paper and had, had a surplus of the, um, the commercial toilet paper. Um, so that's one thing is we had demand just shot up for some things, uh, toilet paper, pressure treated wood, um, computer chips, and at the same time, demand for other th things really dropped that we were used to making on a pretty consistent basis. And then people were being told you, you, you can't come to work because of COVID or the number of people coming to work was severely restricted. So factories had to shut down and ports had to, the ports didn't shut down completely, but they went to really minimal manning. So for a period of time, you know, you just didn't have enough people to unload ships. Truck drivers were just being worked to death because they, um, the, the new demand for things in the United States required truckers to, to really be able to, to move stuff quickly. And that's been a continual thing. We've had a shortage of truck drivers for years and years, um, mm. which is another funny thing because normally trucking gets its capacity for people when, when, when we're short on truck drivers, normally people in construction, when trucking starts to pay more of the construction, they swing over to trucking. And right now construction and trucking are both paying really well. So we're not getting a lot of the people that would normally shift over to trucking shifting. They're staying, staying in construction. Yeah. These days we, we, when we see problems in, <laughs> in society and elsewhere, uh, we tend to just say, yeah, it's, 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 it's a COVID thing. And you're saying that for this, this is another one of those things where COVID really had an impact. I don't think we've had anything impact our transportation and factories and inventories like COVID since World War II. Wow. And the biggest, the biggest difference between now and World War II is in World War II, um, you know, the government rationed goods. And I, I don't think we're quite there yet, but it's not inconceivable to think that in the future, we might have to start rationing things. Um, just because of the, the dramatic impact it's had. Are you talking about like at Costco where they say, okay, one package of toilet paper per customer? Right. Christmas is gonna be interesting. <laughs> um, mainly because a lot of the Christmas gifts are off the port of Long Beach, Los Angeles right now. 7 a.m. at GameStop. It's kind of this interesting thing we have going on in the United States too. 80% 80, 80 of the freight in the United States comes into the West Coast of the United States. But 80% of the people in the United States live on the East Coast. And for years and years and years, that's been the cheapest way to, to get freight to the people on the East Coast is bringing in the West Coast, put it on trains and trucks and get, a, get it to the East Coast. Um, but, you know, right now it's stuck. Well, why is that? Um, you know, it looks really simple. You take, put stuff on a ship, you take it off a ship. These ships hold up to 14,000, um, we call them 20 foot equivalent units. So that's a 20 foot trailer. Uh, normal semi truck, the ones we normally see on the back of a semi truck are 40 foot trailers. So we're talking the equivalent of 7,000 semi truck trailer on, on one of these ships. And you just start thinking of the sheer scale 
of what you would need to do to make all this work. Um, we would need an army of truck drivers and trucks and trailers. So it's not a problem that is going to resolve itself quickly just because there's so many different kind of facets to it. So, I mean, it, all these images, you know, they make for, you know, good TV, I guess, but what, uh, how, what's the significance there and the impact? I mean, you mentioned Christmas. Christmas, uh, gosh, there, I mean, I mean, the craziest thing is sometimes we don't realize how interconnected all these supply chains are. So um, going back to the iPhone, one of the key, one of the key things they need in the iPhone is COBOL to make computer screens um, or the, the phone screens. And uh, it's mostly found in either some parts of China, but mostly in, in Congo, in Africa. And it's at the point now where it's getting really hard to, to ship anything in the world. And especially from these, re, these smaller ports in countries, you know, like Nigeria that are where the African cobalt would come to. Um, so you kind of have this, we're, gonna, we're, we're having to make choices on what goes on ships. And because we're having to make choices, um, it, it, that's where I see lots of shortages happening in the near future, probably some inflation kicking in with it um, as stuff becomes more scarce. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not meaning to sound negative. I'm just, um, I think this will resolve itself. All of the people in the industry right now are saying it's going to probably take at least a year to get things kind of back and running normal uh, as Pre-COVID. Back to getting my Amazon shipment next day. Um, yeah. <laughs> Amazon, Amazon's kind of the master at the last mile part of the supply chain. So getting stuff to your doorstep. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens on their supplier side. So the people that get them stuff to sell. Right. So what does that actually look like when I go to either online to get, do my Christmas shopping or even just to the grocery store? Um, grocery stores are going to be really interesting, part, partly because we're, we're a little spoiled, to be honest. We, we go to the grocery store and we expect to get bananas, right? And b- bananas come from Central and South America, um, but they're there every day. And if we start to prioritize other things over bananas, uh, that banana, you know, bananas could disappear very quickly from stores because they have a really short shelf life. So um, it kind of depends what our priorities are. You know, if our priority is to keep people, let's keep the food supply chain going. um, I I think grocery stores probably probably will be okay. And part of that is a lot of our food too is is grown domestically. Some of the the stuff we have like strawberries in, in the winter time, obviously are not coming from the United States, but. Mexico has not been affected as much where they grow a lot of these. So I I guess the the bottom line is there's going to be, we're going to have shortages. And I think um, usually rationing in the United States at least happens through what's most valuable. So the things that are most valuable are the things that are going to be prioritized to get on transportation and to markets. Um, For Christmas, things won't be as available. And that one gift you want to get people, I think you're going to just have to be a lot more flexible and and find other things, you know. (laughs) And is that also going to be, I mean, if we can find it, is it going to be costing us a lot more? Um, The secondary markets are for sure. So people that go and buy stuff and then sell it on, you know, whatever online forum they want to sell it on. Um, I think those prices are going to be very high. Uh, retailers are generally, generally speaking, pretty good about not, not trying to jack prices up. Um, you know, they, they, retailers like Walmart, Target, some of the bigger, bigger box stores, they, they tend to look at consumers not for the one-time sale, but for the lifetime value of that customer. 
And the last thing in the world they want is to be labeled as that company that during, when all this stuff happened during the pandemic, they, they jacked their prices up and um, now no one wants to shop with them. So generally speaking, I think you're gonna see them working really hard to try to keep, keep prices at a reasonable level. That's why gas was so inexpensive through COVID was there was just a glut on the market. And then since demand is ramped up, um, it's not keeping up. The, the supply is not keeping up with the demand. Plus the, during COVID, it shut down a lot of the domestic production of fuel and it's expensive to ramp those things back up. So kind of what we're seeing is that that'll correct itself over time. But yeah, that's what we're seeing is supply chain issues, either issues with transportation, issues with storage, issues with getting the right parts for things. The car supply chain right now, you know, there's two separate issues going on there. One is people, people got excess, a little bit of excess money during COVID with stimulus checks and a lot of them bought cars. So there was a spike in demand for cars, but then the computer chip industry just couldn't keep up with all of the demands for their chips be, because demand spiked in a lot of different areas all at once. Mm -hmm. I, I think what not a lot of people realize is the second biggest cost of a, of a product that you buy, um, the largest cost is the cost to actually make the product and all the pieces that go in it. Um, the second biggest cost is transportation. And the cost of transportation right now is, is so to ship a, a 40 foot container from Shanghai to Long Beach um, before the pandemic was about 22,000 to $2,500. Um, this morning, it was over $12,000 to ship that same container. Oh, wow. So we're talking a six times increase in transportation costs. Um, and I think that's what consumers are gonna see is they're gonna to have to pay for that not only for the scarcity, but also the costs have gone, gone up significantly on transportation. What is the timeline? You mentioned before a year. Is that a year where things sort of sort themselves out or? I, I think it's gonna take some interventions. Um, and like I said, we've seen President Biden already talking to the ports about going at full capacity. Um, there's something's gonna to have to be done about trucking how we're going to increase the amount of capacity we have in trucking. And that could be done through either expanding the number of hours truckers can drive, but then you get into some safety issues, or it could be, um, you know, finding, finding people and figuring out ways to get people that are not now in the workforce in, into the transportation professions. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not that it's not going to sort itself out. It is, but I think with a little bit of intervention, we could, we could speed it up a little bit. Is there any other yeah, specific intervention solutions? Yeah. <laughs> so NAFTA is one. If we change NAFTA so that truck drivers from Mexico could drive on American roads, uh, more right now they're restricted to the number of miles they can actually drive on American roads. Um, if we lifted that restriction, we would have a lot more truck drivers available to drive trucks. And I'm not quite sure the technology is 100% there yet, but autonomous trucks are, they're coming in the near future, um, maybe five years, maybe 10 years. Um, if we could speed that up, it pulls drivers out of trucks so that basically trucks are driving themselves. And the nice thing about that is, is not that you're taking a person out of the cockpit, it's actually that then they can do what's called platooning where several trailers are following one truck. So it's almost like a train on the road. Um, and it, that's more of a legislation thing, to be honest. Um, laws need to be passed to allow that to happen. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, on, on some of the shortages, rationing is one way to 
to just kind of set a new status quo so that we're not consuming so much of things so that you know for for a period of time if we could ration things a little bit um, then it might allow the system to catch up a little faster than it is now I, I will tell you though Americans we are just not very good at rationing. <laughs> We're not very good at having someone tell us what we can buy and what we can't buy. It's just, we're pretty individualistic and it's kind of against, against our, our whole nature. <laughs> so let's say things sort themselves out in the next you know, y- year or two or, or whatever it looks like. What about those prices though? Do they stay high? Does, does this stick around? Well, what all the research shows us is generally what happens when you have a spike in demand like we've seen for things like pressure treated wood and cars and some of the other things where there's been a huge, you know, huge spike in demand and prices go up, factories start working over time to meet the demands there. And we get kind of where the point where demand is saturated. So in other words, everyone that got stuck home and built a deck, um, they don't need to build any more decks. But the factories are working overtime to get that pressure treated wood that the, that the economy is calling for, that pe- consumers are calling for. And eventually probably what the, again, this is what all the research says is we'll hit a point where there's then going to be a glut in the market and the prices will drop considerably. And as supply chain professionals, really what we want to do is make it so that we don't get these huge spikes and then it drops off a cliff in terms of prices and demand. We would much sooner kind of smooth things out a little bit. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of why I think rationing is not a bad idea is because it would help, you know, help with that spike in demand so that companies aren't reacting to it so much. And then um, it'll help soften the, the blow when, when there's a glut on the market as well. And is that mostly on businesses to decide, okay, yeah, we're just going to, you know, have people only allowed to buy this much? Um, that would be nice, but businesses are really, I, I mean, they're in business to make money, you know, that's, and I think when the demand's high, they're, they're going to want to produce to, to meet people's demand. They don't want their customers to be disappointed with them or to, to feel like they can't provide. I, I actually think it's more on the consumers. And like I said, that in the United States, that's really difficult. Because as consumers, we're not very good at like saying, I, I'll do without a car for the next couple of years. Right. <laughs> um, okay, well, if we can sort of recap, uh, if I were to say, you know, uh, how bad is the supply chain issue right now? How would how would you describe that? I again going back to World War II. I don't I don't think we've seen anything like this on the uh, supply chain side of things since World War II. Collapse. What what does that look like, and what would put us over that edge? I hope it doesn't happen. I <laughs> if it collapsed, it would mean that there would be pretty much no ocean transportation. No ocean freight. Most grocery stores, most big box stores keep about a three to four day supply of inventory at their distribution centers. To be quite frank, I don't think that would happen. I I really think the governments of the world are invested enough in this problem right now that I I think it's going to resolve. And then to summarize uh, the impact on the consumer, uh, how would you describe that, that impact right now? I, I think there's going to be some inflation, and uh, mainly because of scarcity, oh, okay. which means there might be empty shelves in stores or things that you're used to seeing that were very available are not going to be available, and because that scarcity, you're going to you're going to end up paying a bit more. Um, again, for Christmas, I would I would be very flexible about what you think you can get for people, and be open to. Maybe time is the most valuable thing you can give people this Christmas. Recent media reports show some signs of improvement with the supply chain, but as you heard, the timeline is up in the air. 
and there's no delaying when the holidays arrive. That does it for us this week here on KSL Plus. I'm Matt Rascone, and we'll see you again next week. Thank <laughs> you.